Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 19th year. This podcast is sponsored by IGB Live, the home of the iGaming community, July 16th through 19th at the Rye Amsterdam. For more information, visit igblive.com. And this week we sit down with Paul Heritak as the principal of Westar Architects, one of the leading design firms for the gaming industry. Westar Architects has established itself as one of the premier design groups for gaming. Led by Paul Heritakis, the company has become known for its innovative style and its ability to understand where the industry is going before it gets there. Their most recent project, done for Churchill Downs, Derby City Casino in Louisville, is part of the revitalization of the downtown area and includes restaurants, gaming, and entertainment. Heritak has also designed the high roller suites in the recently opened Fountain Blue Casino in Las Vegas, which have gotten rave reviews. He also talks about the company's extensive experience in Asia, particularly in Macau. He spoke with me in his offices in Las Vegas in April. Paul, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. Uh, I've seen some of your work recently, and I'm really impressed with what you've been doing. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you for this opportunity. It's great to be speaking with you. Yeah, great. You know, we, we've been uh, we've known each other for a long time, and, and I've never asked you this question. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what what uh, really I drew you to architecture, and, and uh, you know, what, why did you get into it? Um, back in grade school, all I remember doing is this big, huge mural as a class, yeah. and a teacher said, "Boy, you're really good at organizing things. You're really good at architecture. You should become an architect." And yeah. I guess I uh, couldn't even remember what grade or what teacher, but <laughs> I guess that set me on my path, and yeah. I'm off and running. And uh, you know you're you're known uh, for your, your designs in the gaming industry. What what really made gaming uh, fascinating for you? Um, I went to school in Brooklyn at Pratt Institute, and it's mm -hmm. a very serious school that uh, an art school, and it teaches you very traditional, you know, architecture from the masters. Right. And uh, I just could not get Atlantic City out of my mind. Yeah. I used to go down there with my parents, sneak into the casinos, probably when I was sixteen. Yeah. It was only the second place in the country that you can gamble. Right. right. And I was just bitten. The sound, yeah. the noises, the colors, the flashing lights, uh, the energy. It just right. it just bit me from day one. I loved going down there, mm -hmm. and it just always stood with me that I'd love to be able to design buildings like that. So how did how did you really? What was your first job in, in the gaming side of, of the architecture field? Um, I came out here and started working at a couple of companies. One, the first company I worked at did not uh, deal with casinos, mm -hmm. and I just felt like I was missing out, because then once I lived here right. and saw all that was going on, I'm like, sure. I have to get into that world. So right. I worked with a couple of uh, uh, some of the better known architects in mm -hmm. town, and just loved every minute of it, loved the people. I yeah. never knew, uh, it did just amazing people. I met lots of presidents of the properties and yeah. everything. I've known some of them for 30 years now, and they just just the nicest people. I sure. really love doing it. Give us an idea of some of the projects that you worked on and, and that, that people would, would know about. I've worked up and down the strip, almost at all the properties. Uh, a lot of work at New York, New York, casinos, uh, casino space there, Center Bar, uh, Venetian, so many rooms I've remodeled there, uh, restaurants, uh, Bellagio, poker rooms, lounges. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fountain Blue, we just finished up some work on, uh, Mirage I did a lot of work on, so mm -hmm. eventually over the years you you get in and out of uh, a lot of those properties. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure some of the stuff you design are, are already gone now, right? <laughs> I've outlived a lot, it was very funny, I had that conversation with this lady the other day, I said we've done some wonderful stuff, unfortunately we've outlived it all, and uh, you know, that's well, what happens. Well, in that's Vegas, you know, I mean, it's a uh, here, here today, gone tomorrow type of thing. Restaurants yeah. turning over in five or seven rooms in seven years, it's just crazy right. how right. Uh, how everything turns over so quickly. Yeah, yeah no question. So uh, one of your recent projects that I was really impressed with was uh, the casino you, you designed in uh, Louisville. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that and how you got into that. That's really been one of my favorite projects. Uh, I've worked with Churchill Downs before. Mm -hmm. I took one of, one of their sections called Millionaire's Row and uh, built a Matt Wynn Steakhouse, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful steakhouse open all year long. And then uh, for the race, you end up right. buying tickets and... Uh, they probably are seventy five hundred to yeah, right. ten thousand dollars a seat for the weekend, uh, so it's great experience. Great to know those guys, mm -hmm. great people, and uh, we had a build. They bought a building downtown. It was a former U.S. bank building from the nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. We basically ripped it down to the structure and figured out ways to fit a casino, a couple of bars, 
sports bar, a, a masculine bar with bourbon and cigars, a feminine bar with uh, wine tastings and everything else, a great offering. And uh, we really, uh, just, just to do that project in a neighborhood that had gone through some tough times, mm -hmm. it, it had some riots, so the neighborhoods have been struggling. Yeah. So to go down there and help to revitalize that part of town really uh, took uh, what I do to a higher level. Mm -hmm. Not just making things sure. pretty, but really trying to change uh, change a neighborhood, the change a city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really was a great project, and working hand, with, hand, uh, hand in hand with those guys there, uh, the people that were ultimately going to stay there and run the property, watching them get involved with the community and mm -hmm. try to become, you know, community sure. partners. I got to meet the governor, and uh, we spoke about how this project, you know, will be a gentrification and sure. start of something new there. And yeah. it was really a special project. And what's it called? Uh, Derby City Downtown okay. in Lobo. Right. Okay. So these the uh, it's it's just the, the historic horse racing machines in, in Kentucky, correct? Those are uh, hard to tell the difference, yeah, of course, uh, unless right. you're told what yeah, they are, right. you probably wouldn't notice. No, they but, just like every other slot machine. Exactly, yeah. but no table games, but of course sure. sports betting and, and uh, horse race betting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So um, when, when you design the casino, how did you, uh, is it designed like a, a regular slot floor would be designed in terms of, of where the machines are placed and that kind of thing? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, it was spread over two floors, which is not always ideal, but we right. really added a lot of amenities to each floor. And then we have a smoking section, which, you know, right. uh, some of these cities have very stringent laws on right. breaking uh, uh smoking from sure. from the regular and they're outdoors they're technically outdoors with lots of coverage and everything right. but you are out in an outdoor environment so you do feel the weather but uh, it was it was a good challenge it was good it was a fun project okay great so you've worked a lot of, in asia as well specifically in, in macau so how, tell us how you got involved with that um macau was very personal to me uh, my two daughters are adopted from china mm -hmm. um i had been to my wife my wife my family had been to china many many times mm -hmm. And I just felt like I wanted to get more involved. I right. loved going there. I loved the culture. I loved the food. Um, I went there a year before we started the office with my partner, and uh, we just learned more about the culture, learned more about the feng shui and a lot of the uh, mm -hmm. influences there that influenced gaming design sure. uh, before we started. And uh, I was in my 40s looking for a new challenge, and mm -hmm. I said, what the heck, let's open up a company overseas. Yep. Uh, we didn't have a big bank roll. We just went there and started slow and then ended up having well over 100 people working with every casino in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, the operators there loved working with uh, some of the Chinese uh, operators, which is very different from American sure. operators, right, right. their personality, their, their approach and everything. But it, it was just a wonderful experience. And just to be able to know that I went to a foreign country and started a business sure. from right. scratch not knowing anybody, not knowing the language, was a pretty big accomplishment for me personally. Sure, no question. So you were there during the early days of Macau, which is yeah. kind of like the Wild West. <laughs> it was, uh, I, every, every, you were around every corner, there were building a new casino or a new, new property or something like that. I mean, what was it like in those days? It was absolutely crazy. It was the wild, wild west, and uh, everybody came there looking for money mm -hmm. from every country you can imagine. I made tremendous friends from all over the world. Right. Uh, but everybody was there to make money and, and to, to do that. And, and Roger, I cannot tell you how many times I walked into a taxi and there would be a guy, a Chinese guy, walking out and he turns back, grabs a brick of money that's wrapped yeah. in cellophane. <laughs> now their bills are worth more than ours. The brick is like this yeah. big. Yeah. I swear it must be two to three hundred thousand dollars. Like, oh yeah, I forgot my money. Let's get that. <laughs> he grabbed the money and he'd just be like, What did I just see? And that happened multiple times. Mm -hmm. And then we were designing a casino for one of the American operators. I come back to America, I start showing it to the, we designed it in Asia, I came back to America, right. showed the, uh, the guys in charge here what we were doing. I'm like, Paul, come on, man. You, you forgot the bell desk. You forgot the <laughs> bell room. I'm like, no, I didn't. They're like, what do you mean? I said, that guy's coming with a bag full of cash. He ain't giving it to any of you guys. And they're like, well, what about the wife? I'm like, well, her bag's full of money, too. She's going to be hitting the mall. Right. Nobody's giving their bags up here. Just go with it, guys. Uh, just crazy stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but the most amazing thing is how quickly they clean it up. Yeah. Visas, mm -hmm. movement of money. Right. And that city overnight really has cleaned up, and they've cracked down on a lot of the... Uh, 
different types of gambling and right, money right. movements. So sure. Pretty amazing. Well, the, the whole uh, Kotai Strip area was, was just a swamp when, when you first yep. got there, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? And the, the transformation when they, they opened the Venetian there, and now, now that's really the center of town. It is, and, and to go there in the beginning and just see these small casinos or the Lisboa, right. the famous Lisboa that was there right. on the on the Macau Strip, and how smoky and small and uh, the ceilings were right. so low, um, nobody really understood VIP gaming right. and what was happening with that mm -hmm. and how that you have a private room right. that there's more money being gambled in that room than most casinos. Right. There was uh, one of the first casinos I know that opened up was Star World. Right. Uh, after um, the famous Sands Cota, the right. Sands property, which right. paid for itself in nine months, right. that Star World Casino was putting out six billion dollars at the time, yeah. which was equal to the entire Las Vegas mm -hmm. Boulevard. And that was a, a narrow building, uh, probably what what a uh, hundred feet across and, and yeah. uh, what fifty stories high. Yep, and every floor was run by different junket operators, right. and people could not understand the amount of money being right. pushed through those tables. Yeah. Just watching it and being part of that, and we designed so many of those rooms. Sure, it was uh, it was a blast, and uh, you know it was just. Uh, but knowing how much money was, it's just phenomenal. It's a very private version of gaming sure, right. versus America, which is a very mm -hmm. public version of gaming. Yeah, yeah, no question. Uh, <clears throat> so you mentioned it's, it's different uh, designing in Asia. Obviously, you have the feng shui, uh, but uh, what, you had different kind of relationships, I guess, with, with the operators than, than you might have had in the U.S. Yeah, two big things. Uh, first off, you had to be very careful of what materials you chose. Mm -hmm. White stone would 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 represent uh, like funeral, yeah. so you couldn't okay. use you know pure white stone or some of the Italian stones. Uh, exposed uh, exposed uh, candelabra lights. A lot of things you had to learn. You know, using green stones would look like jade. Right. So there's a lot of little things you had to learn. As I said, we spent a year there before we started up trying to catch on to that. But my favorite stuff that I learned there is I met some incredible businessmen from mm -hmm. uh, Chinese businessmen educated in America or in sure. Europe and they were pure business. Here when I show a president of a casino or a CEO they look at it and they go I don't like this, I don't like right. that, you need to pick a new lamp. It's right. a very personal thing to them. Mm -hmm. In China these people are very very wealthy, these executives, they have a very different design sense. Yeah. And they really wouldn't like what they saw, but they would go around the room and say, you know, sir, is this, is this what my client wants? He'd ask the marketing director, the food and beverage right. people, he'd ask everybody along the room, the CFO, the CEO, is this what the customer wants? And every time they'd say, yes, this is exactly what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. And he was very leery because the first time they designed these casinos, they looked a lot different. Sure. And then they would see how successful the designs were, how much more money they were making, and they would start, that built up the confidence in us working with one Chinese group to end up working with all of them. Sure, sure. But it's a very different look, and they're not personal about anything. They would never say, I don't like it, don't build it. They right. would say, if my, I don't, they'll definitely tell me they don't like it, right. but they'll say, if my customer likes it, yeah. that's what that's we build. Course, right. And the funny thing is, we kind of became like the Marines. We were like the first one in. Right. Every time they looked at a different place in another country, they would bring us with them first time out and say, guys, what do you think? How are we going to lay this out? What do you think of what we're doing here? And it was just a great relationship with them. It was right. just extraordinary that... Uh, as foreigners that don't speak their language, we were guests in their home. Sure. We acted with total respect and dignity, and uh, they really brought us in, and, and uh, we had a great relationship with them. We invented, we helped to develop premium mass, mm -hmm. which you know is a, is a better level of customer. Sure. But that all started out around a table. What could we do service-wise to elevate our game? What could we do design-wise? What could we do to make a, a, a a signature club, which is what it was ended up calling, what could we do to make it special? And we developed that with Melco at the time, sure. and it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Now, they had a, a big expat community in terms of uh, people uh, uh, from America and from, from Australia and from Canada and, and even Europe. Uh, people came in you know, to run the casinos. How long did it take them to, to figure out you know, how they had to deal with the Chinese businessmen? And, and if they didn't, what happened to them? Um, the biggest secret to me was ask the question three times. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what would happen is originally I'd be introduced to the casinos from either some of the Australians right. and the Americans and I had built up relationships sure. with them. And we were all trying to figure out what the preferences were there, what would desire there because it certainly wasn't 
America, it certainly was in Australia. Everything was a little different. So we all tried to pool our thoughts and pool our ideas. And eventually, as the years went on, you start to saw a lot of the Westerners be removed mm -hmm. and a lot more Asians right. uh, coming in. And the funny thing was, I would work with the presidents a lot over there, and they were usually, you know, like you say, foreigners. Um, and they would ask the question of their people. They would ask their head hosts or their, right. uh, is, is, is my customer going to like this? Oh, yes, sir, they're really going to enjoy it. Well, what do you think? I mean, do you think they're going to like this? And they yeah. go, well, I, I think they're going to, I think it's good. Then they'd ask them the third time, uh, no, it's got this <laughs> and this, these are bad luck, this is bad right. luck. Okay, good. So after three yeah. times, they were so polite and they were so mm -hmm. uh, uh, not wanting to tell the boss, right. no, we don't bad like news, it, right? or yeah. there's going to be bad yeah. things about the room. So you had to keep at it. And uh, we got used to that. We were fine with that. And we just wanted them to be successful. The, the best thing we want to do is put our... Uh, give our clients something that they could use and put them in a position to succeed. So we all, as Americans working, or as foreigners working with the Chinese, had to get used to each other and uh, really work through some of those issues. IGB Live is the industry's favorite iGaming show, home to over 9,000 of the world's most influential and pioneering iGaming professionals. There is just no better place to connect with the entire iGaming ecosystem if you are looking to meet iGaming operators, affiliates, suppliers, and game developers. So um, back back home here, uh, you just finished uh, designing the suites for the Fountain Blue, which opened late last year, late in 2023. Uh, and uh, the, the the beautiful buildings. What, what kind of direction did you get from from the the owners of the Fountain Blue when when you were developing the the, the, the decor for those uh, those suites? Uh, the two people that I first got uh, introduced as uh, one of them is a branding uh, genius, mm -hmm. legendary Peter Arnell out yeah. of New York, and he has rebranded things for Donna Karen, Samsung, and a million other companies. Just an absolute giant in the industry. Uh, loved uh, working with him, got along with him great. His background was kind of similar to mine and my father's. And uh, the other one was John Rollins, who was uh, Vice President of Design for the Fountain Blue organization. So we started, they started to kind of let me in more on, you know, it, it's Miami, right. it's Fountain Blue, there's mid-century modern influences, we do want to be sympathetic to Vegas, it also has some French influences, so I did the High Roller Suites, uh, they were originally designed by uh, David Collins Studios in uh, London, mm -hmm. so we took their design of three rooms, spread it across 15 rooms and five floors and 250,000 square feet later, mm -hmm. Uh, we ended up doing these suites. Um, so Peter and John really set the tone for what they were going to be. Mm -hmm. They're definitely different than uh, more traditional. A lot of French influences mm -hmm. mixes up a lot of different genres. They have an interesting uh, look to them. And I think they've been very successful. And from what I've read in the uh, different periodicals, people really like them. Right. And uh, they're selling a lot of them as retail, not sure. only to their high rollers, mm -hmm. but it's been uh, real great. And it was just an incredible challenge to do a project that large from start to finish. It was about 18 months. We had it drawn in about six months, which for six months I didn't take a day off. Yeah. Me and my team worked 80 to 95 hours every single week for six months. Uh, tremendous effort by the people in my office. I'm so proud of them. And uh, it was a fun project, but it, it was a battle. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just uh, incredible results. But, you know, we earned every foot of, uh, of progress we made there. So, how often did you have to use a bow tie thing? <laughs> <laughs> Go find Waldo. Um, right. there are a little more so there. downstairs than the, we yeah. did in the suites. It's okay. a little less. We had uh, some wood floors that had the influence, but yeah. a little less, a little, okay. a little less so. Yeah, well, a brilliant, uh, brilliant branding uh, piece right there for sure. I love the property. I think the minute you walk through that property, you feel its sophistication, and elegance. Right. It skews a little younger, which is something new. Their food and beverage program is fabulous. Now they have a long road ahead of them. You know, yeah. they have no database. They're strangers to the city. The location isn't as good as some sure. others, but I, I think they'll find great success. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of what they did there. When you think about properties in Vegas and you walk into them, a lot of them don't say anything to you. They don't right. grab you. They don't mm -hmm. tell you something good. And it has nothing to do with the amount of money, you know, sure. Venetian or New York, New York. It, it's just, you know, it's a fun place to go. Some places capture you the minute you walk through with a certain mm -hmm. essence. 
this one does with sophistication sure. elements, others don't. But uh, real proud of uh, that project and the, the tremendous ownership team and, and everybody involved in getting it done. Sure. Well, it, they put a lot of money into it, that's for sure. They did. I, you know, they did. I'm hoping for the best. Yeah, and they, they had a tough tough road uh, in the beginning here, but uh, I, th I think they're starting to get it together for sure. I think so, too, and, and you're starting to see them do a, a few new things. Did mm -hmm. you see they're going to uh, have a nightclub at the top of right. the... Uh, the Formula right. One building, mm -hmm. so yeah, they're. I think they're they're getting on the right path. I yeah. think they're finding the right combination of leadership. Um, it's tough coming into this town. This town has a million offerings yeah. run by some of the biggest and strongest casino companies out there with databases 40, 50 million people deep. So right. yeah, I, I think some people come in and not, don't realize how hard it's going to be. Sure, right, right. So something else that opened last year, and I know you had nothing to do with this, but the, the Durango Casino opened, uh, the Stations Casino in, in, in the locals market. Uh, yeah. But it seems as though uh, that casino kind of broke all the rules when it came, comes to uh, you know, casino design. Uh, you, you know, it's got, got all these huge windows that are letting in natural light, which you never see in a casino, and, uh, and the slots floor is, is all just the little carousels where there's no lines of slots, you know. So um, what was your impression of that, and does that really represent where casino you know, design is going right now. I, I think Stations does an amazing job. I think they're a brilliant company. I, I, you know, they closed some properties uh, after mm -hmm. COVID that just weren't that great. Right. right. Um, you would think that's insane. These properties are making money, but they did it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Durango Stations, 20 minutes away from uh, Red Rock right, right, yeah. or uh, the other one on the East Coast side. And you would think, do you really need to build one there? Right. And then I go past the Players Club and the line for cards is a mile long. Yeah. Um, you know, for a local, we go to those properties all the time. Sure, There's no right. reason for us to go down to the strip. Sure, right. And now that you're charging me for parking, there's right. even more reason not to go down right. to the strip. But I think that's, you know, if Amon Resorts was going to build a casino, that place was it. It's, yeah. It is very different. What I love, you know, Steve Wynn had these beautiful restaurants that would open mm -hmm. up to the outdoors. And, they'd ha you know, he had a lot of different things going on back there. I've been to the sports book. It opens to the outdoor. That uh, yeah. that lounge in the back, the sure. pool opens up, and it was you know beautiful weather. It was the most beautiful experience to be sitting there with a little breeze, mm -hmm. running into right. those restaurants. I, I think it's great. I think they're doing everything right. Um, it kills me that you have a mirage, you have a uh, Mandalay Bay, which has an enormous amount of landscape that you're taking care of every day, right. and you don't have any view, any restaurant, any bar in the middle of this. You'd yeah, feel like right. you were in, you know, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, but they really did that. They really yeah. made the inside and outdoor mix a lot, like you say, the open, uh, the open windows to the casino, which just has a great feel. And, sure. and, you know, I, I hate to sit there and look at everything as an architect and try, or a designer right. and try to be so picky. I try to look at the customers, and mm -hmm. they're enjoying it, yeah. and they're loving it. And, sure. you know, the food court's filled with businessmen and casino mm -hmm. business people and casino people. Uh, the lounges are attracting both hotel guests and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, local visitors. I just think, you know, the success is there. You know, you just yeah. look at it and... People are taking to it. Yeah, There's no reasons question. to go there. It's really hard nowadays to, to design a casino. You talk about Resorts World, Fountain Blue, $4 billion mm -hmm. each. Did you do anything to differentiate yourself? Right. And then you look at a, a, you know, a station's casino, locals' property, and there are a lot of subtle things that have differentiated themselves from their competitors, and there's a reason to go there. Sure. Yeah. Very That's positive, right. very high yeah. on that company, and very high on what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I really like the sports book. You know, nowadays you don't need you know a, a whole wall of, of uh, betting windows because everybody's betting on their app, uh, and that made it more of a sports bar with with incredible uh, you know screens up there than 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 a sports book. I went there the other day. The food was fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the service was flawless. And then the atmosphere is just great. Right. So here's a funny thing for you, Roger. You know, when I started the, in the business, we put sports books on wheels because every right. six sure. months we were moving them. Right. Well, stations, obviously, their sports books are the size of like a football field. Yeah. This one's a little smaller. Mm -hmm. has great food. You know, a little bit different. Wonderful atmosphere to play it in. But I, I've spoken to people, and they're like, well, we have packed sports books, but we have no idea where these people are betting. Right, they're yeah. not all betting with us, because sure, our right, windows, yeah. you know, we yeah. wouldn't be able to keep up. Everybody has such access to the internet nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, you have no idea who they're betting on. I keep watching hockey games, and they keep talking about betting lines, which, right, yeah. you know, when you and I were first in this industry, you would never talk right, about a betting right, line. Yeah. Um, so it's really crazy how the industry's changed yeah. and how the sports books have changed, but I think that's a... 
that's a new way of presenting a sports book. And again, I think Stacey's did a wonderful job on that. Right, right. So you mentioned food courts. Uh, you know, buffets seem to be a thing of the past, and if they're not, they, they, they have a price tag on them that, that you might as well sit down in a gourmet restaurant. So yeah. um, uh, obviously the, the transition of food courts is, is, is ongoing here. Uh, do you see that continuing? I do, but uh, you know, I've been going to Asia for so long. And I, I, you know, I've been going to Thailand for a long, long time, and they have some spectacular malls that are so high-end, and yeah. they had the most amazing food courts in their basements. Yeah. Finally, we're starting to catch up to that level. Mm -hmm. we, we stop, you know, we're playing word salad with a right. food court versus a, right. uh, a food hall. Right. In the beginning, they really looked very similar. I will give it to stations where you can walk into their food court and they have kind of a, a traditional food hall, excuse mm -hmm. me. They have a kind of traditional food presentation. Hey, I'm going up and getting my food and I'll sit down. And then they have the Italian restaurant where right. you're kind of going into that. That's what I saw in Asia, in, in Asia, in Hong Kong, and Thailand, probably 15, 20 years mm -hmm. ago. They're finally starting to do better presentations, I think, on a true food hall. Right. So I really like that. And it's amazing if you go there for lunch, you will see all those people from on Commons, right. all the real estate people eating lunch there. They're all business people sure. with ties right. and everything yeah. else. They're not gambling. Um, but that again, that's the success of it. Uh, again, stations knows they have to make money a lot of different ways, and, and they really hit it. So I'm hoping those food halls take that next generational sure. step because sure. I just saw some amazing things in Asia. And, you know, we travel around all over the world to, to find some of these sure. ideas. I was in Taiwan a few years ago, and uh, they have these incredible uh, uh, night courts, uh, night night markets, where yep. where they have uh, incredible varieties of food. And I mean, that could be something that could also be incorporated into into the U.S. and any casinos around the world. Actually, I agree with you hundred percent, and I think it's called Mazan Mazan at uh, Venetian, mm -hmm. small little food offering, Israeli Mediterranean. Right. Uh, you know, no bigger than this uh, this conference room, and they're pumping out great food, yeah. an amazing amount of. And to me, I love that. There you go, a little a little food offering. Off, uh, you have so many uh, people there on conventions. You can get them in and out. Why can't we do new things like that? And uh, you know, I think when you look at other other countries and other cities, there's a lot there that uh, we could learn from. Sure, no question. So. Um, there's a lot of regional casinos out there right now that are that are doing expansions and uh, and even building new properties, but uh, but their budgets are always pretty limited. You know, when in a regional market you can't build a billion dollar property, it's going to be three or four hundred million, but you still have to make it look right. How, how do you how do you deal with that kind of budget restriction when you're trying to build something really different? Um, I think you just have a different idea. You know, you're not building four thousand rooms, maybe right. you're building three or four hundred. Mm -hmm. I love those places because they have, you know, an hour and a half radius, X yeah. amount of people, that's their customer, what are you going to do to get them there? Yeah. Now, the interesting to me is how challenging they can be. Uh, sometimes everybody just loves the property, they'll go there and spend money on gambling, food and beverage, and it, it works out great. Others, you cannot get them to, to eat anything. You right. know, they just will just go there and gamble and then go home. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. Sometimes it's a little harder than you think. But the budget really isn't a problem because you're not yeah. building such a great property. You're only, your competition is three hours away. Right. You, you know, so you, you focus your efforts a little differently. But trying to figure out what the right proper amenities are is a challenge. Yeah. Okay, great. So one last question, and uh, the question is, uh, how, how has uh, casino design changed? But uh, and I know it's changed a lot. Is that what keeps you interested in it? Because it's not it's not the same thing when when we started like 30, 40 years ago. That's really tough because uh, back in the uh, the early two thousands, everything was sexy. The Palms was opening up. The right. uh, the the um, Hard Rock was already in town the advertisements on the, on the billboards, everybody was half naked. Every presentation we did was very sexy, very cool. Um, it was a period of time. Uh, we were spending huge dollars redoing things. Uh, MGM reinvented what restaurants looked like. They invented the Ultra Lounge. It was such an amazing time. You, would, you weren't competing against your neighbor. You were competing against what's going on in New York and Dubai. Right. It was just an amazing time, and I, I always love the famous quote by uh, Versace's uh, sister, uh, Donatella. She mm -hmm. says, this to me was what true Vegas was at the time. Goes, we don't design for the wife, we design for the mistress. Right. And <laughs> I just thought that encapsulated that period of yeah. time. Well, obviously, you know, 
periods of time, politics, things change over the years. They cycle as, you know, in the 1920s, sure. the roaring 20s. So now we're in a little bit of a different period. It's more about, you know, remodels, refreshes. You don't go in and tear everything apart. Uh, we're more conscious about being woke. Not everything is so uh, sexy and fun. Um, so it's just in a different period right mm -hmm. now. But you, you always got to try to figure out uh, the casinos, how to make money and what sure, to right. do to attract it. And, and different things over different periods of time attract those people. Some of those things, you know, things go in and out of style. Poker sure. was a huge thing for a while. Right. Sportsbook was a huge thing for a while. Um, celeb uh, celebrity chefs or famous, you know, Michelin starred chefs. Now we go a little more TV chefs. Golf was a big thing now. Nobody's right. playing golf. Right. It, you know, it just cycles over. You got to try to stay ahead of that. I, my biggest thing is when I talk to clients about new projects, and we get involved with so much master planning of large scale resorts, is what are you doing to differentiate yourself? Right. Why do I want to go to your property? Right. What are you offering me that your neighbor's not? And it, it's a twofold question because we could do that with operations and we could do it with uh, unique offerings, but how easy is it for me to copy that? You know, sure, Resorts right. World had a great bar and some gaming on the roof. Within six months, MGM opened up the same thing, bigger, better, faster, because right, they yeah. have you know, the ability to do that. So it, it's, it's tough to keep up, yeah. but uh, we did some amazing projects, $3,000 a square foot. You know, sometimes I, I wonder, I, uh, in my 30s, we were doing uh, fancier projects than we are today, but right, yeah. uh, there's always hope. But you got you got to have something special, especially in this day and age when you can just gamble on your on your sofa. You know, you can pull out your phone and gamble. So you got to have something really special to attract them to the casinos. I, I think that's the scariest thing. We're starting to see the numbers flip. You and I had right. a bit of a conversation the other day in Atlantic City. How mm -hmm. people are visitation is dropping, right. but the numbers are still going up because of the internet gaming and right. you know whether they they are offering sports and mm -hmm. uh, games. So. It's really scary about that, and I just keep always preaching that why are people coming to this property? And they look at me funny, and they look at me like, well, we're this, we're that. I'm like, right. all right, that's still not bringing me to your property. Right. Let, let's have a real conversation about why am I coming here? Right. And it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, it takes putting aside an ego and, and looking at it closer. And also, I think the operators need to understand the connection between gambling online and gambling in their property. And they, they, I, don't, I don't think they would actually come to the realization that they need to promote their property online much more than they're doing right now. Yes, I think so. And I think people need, need to realize it's, it's a three-legged table. Mm -hmm. Design, of course, is one of those legs. Operation and then what you're offering, what right. you're... Uh, what you're putting out there, whether it be food, gaming, right. or whatever, why do I want to go to your property? Right. I don't want to s mention specific properties, but some of them are being remodeled. I'm like, I don't care what you do, I'm never going to that property yeah. again. Yeah. And as I said, you know, you have a Durango station, or I could drive 20 minutes to the strip, be charged $30 for parking, mm -hmm. and that's before I enter the door. So right. why? what are you giving me that I really need to be there? Right. And it's a hard thing, it's right. a hard to answer. Right. Well, Paul, thanks for the time. It's uh, good to get get in touch with you finally. I mean, we've want, wanted to do this for a long time, and uh, you know, yeah, your uh, your design uh, ideas are really uh, taking over a lot of part of the industry. So I really I'm glad we could get together. Thank you so much, Roger. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we've known each other a long time. I cherish your friendship. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this week's podcast, sponsored by IGB Live, the home of the iGaming community, July 16th through 19th at Rye Amsterdam. For more information, visit igblive.com. To learn more about the topics we discussed today, visit ggbmagazine.com. Subscribe to GGB News to get all the news of the gaming industry delivered to your desktop every Monday morning. Sign up at ggbnews.com and use the coupon code GGB180 for a free subscription. Don't miss a single episode of the podcast. Subscribe on Amazon, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify today. So we'll see you next time on the GGB Podcast.